morning. morning. It is good to be with you again because I did the intro this morning, so you already know I'm here and I've already seen all of you, but it's good to be with you all for worship. For those of you who are tuning in online or are just tuning in on Jefferson Baptist Virtual a little bit later, my name is Brendan and I'm the pastor of Jefferson Baptist Church and we're glad to have you uh, here to worship as well. If you would, uh, turn in your Bibles, uh, if there are a few Bibles there, you're going to be on page 1,618, and if you have your personal Bibles or devices, we're going to be back in Luke chapter 12, verses 22 through 34 this morning, and as you get there, just a little bit of a recap. Uh, we began chapter 12, uh, where Jesus spoke directly to his disciples as the large crowd uh, came pressing in on them, and he gave them three noteworthy lessons. And then two weeks back, after Brian or Brian preached in between there, which I'm very thankful he filled in, and I hope you guys were able to practice some fervent prayer as, as Brian so passionately preached and encouraged us to do. Uh, and so, and then two weeks back, uh, we encountered the parable of the rich fool, if, if you recall, when a man came seeking selfish gain through an inheritance uh, from Jesus. And in that passage, Jesus called us to be rich toward God uh, by not selfishly trusting in our own possessions, but humbly relying on the Lord and recognizing His hand and providing all that we have. Uh, and today, uh, today, Jesus returns His focus to His disciples, no longer speaking to the rest of the crowd, but He's turning and admonishing them. He gives two admonitions. He gives two do-nots. There are teachings that we need to hear and, and seek obedience to as his disciples uh, today. And so this is uh, God's word to us from Luke chapter 12, verses 22 through 34. Listen to God's word to you this morning. And he said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn, and yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you, are, are you than the birds? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? If then you are not able to do as small a thing as that, why are you anxious about the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass which is alive in the field today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? And do not seek what you are to eat and what you are to drink, nor be worried, for all the nations of the world seek after these things. And your Father knows that you need them. Instead, seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourself with money bags that do not grow old, with a, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be. Also, this is God's word. Would you pray with me this morning? Heavenly Father, we ask that you would be present now. Open our hearts, our minds, and our ears to hear uh, your word so that we can take it and be obedient to it. Uh, put it into practice in our lives so that we can seek to build your kingdom uh, both here and wherever it is that you would have us go. We ask it all in Jesus' powerful name this morning. Amen. So we currently live in the most chaotic, anxiety-ridden, and fearful circumstances that any of us have ever experienced in our lifetime. And this is on top of all the other strains and situations that cause fear and anxiety in us as well. And supposedly we have 40 million, probably more since COVID-19, uh, clinically anxious adults in the United States. Adults being anyone 18 or older as expressed by the Anxiety and Depression Association of America. 
40 million is a lot of people. But what Jesus points out this morning is that 40 million is actually a low estimate for the human condition regarding the sins of anxiety and fear. The truth, our teacher tells us, is that all humans, yes, all of us here today, to one degree or another, suffer from the sins of anxiety and fear. If you've been told by a clinical counselor or psychologist or someone else that you are abnormal for experiencing such symptoms or emotions, their observation is incomplete. Because Jesus taught, as only the God-man who perfectly understands the human condition could, that we all fall prey to anxiousness and fearfulness as human beings. But Jesus doesn't give us an out because of this diagnosis of, of all of us. He doesn't just say, oh well, we all deal with it. Uh, it's just something you have to suffer with without hope. No. No, Jesus commands we take responsibility for our sinful tendency and gives us two very important interconnected ways of what we are to do in order to combat fearfulness and anxiety in our hearts as his followers. And so he commands us this morning in the text, do not be anxious or afraid. And that's how we're going to go through it. We're going to break it down just that way. First, we are not to be anxious. So do not be anxious. And then two, do not be afraid. So do not be anxious. So as we jump into the text today, we need to keep in mind that Jesus had just finished speaking to the crowd after the man came demanding Jesus give him his inheritance uh, from his brother. As Jesus rebuked the man, he taught the need to diligently guard against the love of material possessions, or the sin of covetousness, as it's called. And he reinforced this teaching with the parable of the rich fool, where he concluded with this statement, So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Which created a perfect segue for him to turn once again and continue teaching his disciples concerning these things. And that's exactly what he did in verses 22 and 23. Jesus is speaking and he said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on. For life is more than food and the body more than clothing. These words reinforce again what Jesus said above as he spoke to the whole crowd. In Luke 12, verse 15, he said, Take care and be on guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. But the tone that Jesus is using is very different. He is speaking with great care to his disciples to help them understand the greater effects or the fallout that come from the sin of covetousness. And one of those effects that comes from idolizing the world and the possessions and comforts that it offers is anxiety. And the first command he gives is that we are not to be anxious. The word for anxious being used by Jesus here has a positive and negative aspect to it. The positive aspect is a heartfelt concern or to care about something. Like a mother watching a child venture off on its first steps or waiting for a diagnosis on a possible health concern. Those are all things that we naturally can be concerned about. But the negative aspect is to become anxious, overly concerned, or worried. And his focus is, remember, here on our physical life, things that are happening here. It's very earthly. And so, in other words, if you're watching your child venture off and your heart is skipping a beat, and you feel the need to rush and pick them up before any danger occurs, or you sit awaiting a health diagnosis, running all the possible scenarios for your mind, causing your stomach to churn and grow sick, and your chest to feel heavy, your heartfelt concern or care has begun to devolve into anxiousness, which can easily happen in any or many earthly scenarios that we face each and every day. It's important to note that Jesus does not give an out concerning our anxiousness, concerning worldly things. There is no caveat to his command here. His command is, do not be anxious about your life. This is a hard command to consider. 
And his rationale for saying this is simple, something we all know but resist. He says, for life is more. For your life is more. Our life is more than material possessions. It is more than a clean bill of health. And it is far more than comfort without suffering or any possibility of danger. In other words, there is more to life than your immediate gratification from worldly goods. There is more to life than simply getting to eat and have clothing. The reality is that as we seek comfort in something or these worldly things, it can easily become costly to our souls, as was the case with the rich fool. Jesus doesn't follow suit with our modern mentality that teaches the necessity of fulfilling felt needs to curb our anxiety. Treat yourself, as some would say, is not a biblical mindset. In fact, Jesus is directly contradicting the pyramid of a famous psychologist, Mr. Abraham Maslow, and what his pyramid would suggest are basic needs. These basic needs, in his opinion, would be fulfilled before we can move on to higher needs being met. But Jesus is radically different in his assessment and understanding of what we need as human beings in this life. And he is going to point us to one thing, as we'll see. And I would say Jesus is correct in his assessment of our human needs in an infinitely greater degree than Mr. Maslow or any other secular, clinical, or even integrationist Christian counselor. What Jesus determines as our basic needs are far more than Lululemon leggings, North Face jackets, and pumpkin spice lattes in a nice, cozy setting, and in a hopeful emotional and spiritual satisfaction that those things will bring. For they don't bring us the sole satisfaction of rest from anxiety we want, do they? And Jesus' assessment of felt needs, worldly comforts or things, makes it clear that pursuing them is actually what will not satisfy, but it will indeed foster the anxiety in our hearts that we are seeking to get rid of all the time. And he concretely illustrates this as he goes on with the reality of what we face. And he speaks of the ravens. In verse 24 he says this, Consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn, and yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds. We don't have ravens around here, which are like big crows, basically, but we know what a crow is. Jesus could have quite literally been pointing to a raven and saying this. Consider this. And I'm not pointing to any birds in here in case some of you are afraid of birds. But have you ever thought about how real what he says is to us? Consider the crows. When you drive down the road and you see a dead possum, raccoon, squirrel, deer, or any other creature that has been killed by a human-operated vehicle, and the carcass is being munched on by these cawing, craving birds of black, or when you see them scavenging on the mushed remnants of some discarded french fries or chicken nuggets in a McDonald's parking lot, all of this and much more is provisioned for them by the providential hand of God who upholds all reality and life by the word of his power. Amen. And Jesus reminds us, in God's economy, we are way more valuable than some lice-ridden, annoying black bird. Amen. Which is exactly why he asks his disciples the question he did in verse 25 and 26. And which of you, being anxious, can add a single hour to the span of life. If then you are not able to do a small thing as that, why are you anxious about the rest? If you can't add minutes to the clock, if you can't remove the age that continues moment by moment, leading you to the inevitable death we all await as God has determined in His book of life, why are you anxious? If God has determined even what the crows will eat alongside I-79, and you are of unspeakably more worth than they are, why are you anxious? But Jesus knew that one example was not enough, so he asked the disciples to consider another item of God's creation. In verse 27. In verse 27 we read, Consider the lilies, 
how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. One of the most precious gifts I have learned from, from Retta is to rejoice in wonder of God's created life. Animals and plants alike. Uh, her joy in smelling flowers and the elation that comes from gazing at the glories of the garden produce in me a delight that I would never have known apart from her. And she sees what Jesus is talking about here. Retta finds joy in the beauty of the flowers while they are here, but she knows they only last for a moment, which is why she's always asking me to buy more. <laughs> you see, plants, and especially the flowers, the glory of the field, are more splendid than the richest and wisest human king our annals of history has ever known, King Solomon. But even as Jesus is pointing this out to the disciples, he uses this example to segue into something else. And he says this in verses 28. But if God so clothed the grass, which is alive in the field today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O oh you of little faith? One of the most... Of all the things that Jesus could say, he says that anxiety is attributed to our lack of faith. That's a hard pill to swallow. But if he did not reveal our sin of faithlessness and worrying here, we would be without the remedy he gives for our anxiety. You see, our remedy for anxiety is that we are to rest our faith in the God who sustains even the most fleeting of life. Anxiety comes from a skewed or nearsighted perspective of God's control over our life, especially of our own life. If we only look outward, that is horizontally, observing the death and corruption of the created order around us, or we see what appears to be circumstances that are insurmountable and outside of God's control, our only option will be to suffer from anxiety. Because our perspective is on an earth that is sin-sick and dying, that appears to be governed by an impersonal force of chaos, rather than a sovereign creator working all things for our good and His glory. Our eyes can easily be downcast in this world of sorrows. And Thomas Watson, a Puritan, wrote a book called All Things for Good, and he says this in it. He says, we meet many Christians who have tears in their eyes and complaints in their mouths, but there are few with their harps in their hands who praise God in affliction. To be thankful in affliction is a work peculiar to a saint. Every bird can sing in spring, but some birds will sing in the dead of winter. Everyone almost can be thankful in prosperity, but a true saint can be thankful in adversity. And how is it that we can do as Watson says? How can our souls sing in that harsh, inviting winter of anxiety that we all often face? Well, we rest our faith not in the fleeting uncertainties of our current circumstances or possessions of the world, but on the never-changing God whose gracious hand is powerful beyond our comprehension. The God who speaks and ravens and lilies are satisfied. The God who speaks and rhinos and lions eat on the prairie of the Sahara Desert. The God who speaks and raises up nations and brings them low. The God who spoke, let there be in the furthest reaches of the cosmos for laid in perfection. Is the God who says to your soul this morning, find rest from your anxious heart in me. Amen. That is the God we serve. He is who we need to put our faith in to curb our anxiety. Jesus then moves from the illustrations to a clear directive for his followers in verses 29 through 31. He says, And do not seek what you are to eat and what you are to drink, nor be worried. For all the nations of the world seek after these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Instead, seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. In concluding his teaching, Jesus reiterated his command not to be anxiously seeking for worldly goods. And his reasoning is that all other people seek after these things. The word for nations being used here is ethnos, the word we get ethnicity from, which again reinforces 
the reality that anxiety is a whole human race problem. We all suffer with this. Jesus is telling us that if we are his followers, we should look different in our pursuits than everyone else in the world. There should be a joy and assurance that pervades our personas as followers of Jesus, not simply a prevalence to fear and constant worry and anxiety. And the reason this ought to be is because we are not, we are not rat racing for material advantage. We know God will provide material goods. And we know because He promises that as we seek to build His kingdom, as we have been called as His disciples, His words are a clear and true promise for us here this morning. As He says, all these things will be added to you. You will be fed. You will be clothed. And you will be comforted as, as God desires as you pursue His kingdom. As you are obedient to pray for God's kingdom come, as you're obedient to treat your neighbor with the love of the kingdom of God, as we've been called in so many different ways. As you grow in bringing God's kingdom, you will grow in the righteousness, peace, and joy that Jesus Christ alone can bring. And as you grow by God's Spirit working within you, your anxiety will lessen in greater and greater degrees. It will lessen. Jesus commands us, do not be anxious. As we rest our lives in His sovereign care and pursue His kingdom, our anxiety will lessen. We should grow more free in peace and joy as we consider our Creator's mercy and grace upon us as His creation. Jesus also commands here today, do not be afraid. A common emotion that comes along with anxiety. And Jesus' words concerning fear are where we turn to next. So we are not to be Fearful or anxious or afraid. So do not be anxious or afraid. So now we are turning to the fear. Do not be afraid. Jesus continued his teaching and commanded this to the disciples in verse 32. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Jesus' command to his disciples was not to fear. His words here echo exactly what he had already taught them at the beginning of chapter 12. One of those things we were to take note of in Luke chapter 12, verses 4 through 7. He says, I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body and after that have nothing more that they can do, but I will warn you whom to fear. Fear him who, after he has killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? And not one of them is forgotten before God? Why even the hairs of your head are all numbered? Fear not, you are of more value than many sparrows. So it's clear that Jesus, as he's been going through chapter 12 and teaching us as his disciples, wants us not to fear. And in the scripture passage I just read, he spoke to the disciples as their friend. And now, in our current text, Jesus is speaking to his disciples, telling them not to fear as their shepherd. He said, Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Jesus spoke as the shepherd that he was and is, the great shepherd that was promised in Ezekiel. God himself, who would come to comfort and save the lost sheep of the house of Israel through making a covenant of peace that would never be abolished. Ezekiel chapter 34 verses 25 through 31 offers us this promise. It says, I will make with them a covenant of peace and banish wild beasts from the land so that they may dwell securely in the wilderness and sleep in the woods. And I will make them and the places all around my hill a blessing. And I will send down the showers in their season. They shall be showers of blessing. And the trees of the field shall yield their fruit and the earth shall yield its increase and they shall be secure in their land. And they shall know that I am the Lord when I break the bars of their yoke and deliver them from the hand of those who enslave them. They shall no more be a prey to the nations, nor shall the beasts of the land devour them. They shall dwell securely, and none shall make them afraid. And I will provide for them renowned plantations, so that they shall no more be consumed with hunger in the land, and no longer suffer the reproach of the nations. And they shall know that I am the Lord their God with them, that they, the house of Israel, are my people, declares the Lord God, and you are my sheep, human sheep of my pasture, and I am your God, declares the Lord God. 
And it is through faith in this great shepherd, Jesus Christ, the secure of the covenant of peace with our God, that we are delivered from death and hell forever, but also from the power and dominion of sin, anxiety and fear included. There is no valley too dark, even a valley so dismal as the valley of the shadow of death, that is too much for the shepherd's rod and staff of comfort to a weary, anxious, and fearful heart. David knew this as he wrote Psalm 23, looking forward to our great shepherd. Psalm 23, verses 1 through 6 says this, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So as you desire not to be anxious or to not be afraid, run to Jesus Christ. Run to your Savior, the one who has secured the covenant of peace with our God, who gives us all of the spiritual riches that are ours in the heavenly places, as we see in the Scriptures. For in Christ alone, we find the fullness of the kingdom of our Father, and the fullness that the kingdom is that He desires to give us. He is the treasure of the kingdom, the good and pleasing gift to mankind unto salvation, the heavenly treasure of such great love, mercy, and hope that none of us can fathom it from the gracious God who works all things for our good and for us as His people, His glory. This is the promise we have. Run to Jesus to be free from your fear. And as you rest your faith in Jesus, the very essence of the kingdom, all He asks becomes much easier to accomplish in verse 33. We see, sell your possessions, give to the needy, provide yourself with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. Giving away our time, money, talents, food, clothing, and care, all these earthly things simply becomes a natural byproduct, or it should become a natural response of us as we love our neighbors because of the love we have been shown in Christ. When we understand that we have the kingdom of God through our Savior, and when we grasp this, the hope we have in the shepherds of our souls, the kingdom living, this kingdom living without fear, becomes much easier. Because our hearts are at rest, locked securely in the treasure chest of Christ before the throne of God in heaven, where no moth or rust can touch us. As Jesus concluded in verse 34, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Anxiety and fear are a match made in hell. They steal your faith and your hope. But Jesus calls us to look to our God who is in control of all things, reminding us that every circumstance we face is no accident. God is working for your good and His glory. Amen. If He feeds the ravens, the crows, and gives life to the fleeting lilies, He will take care of you as His disciples. And Jesus also taught us not to fear because our great shepherd and savior guides us by faith. The eternal treasure that binds our hearts to the heavens and sets our hopes there. So do not be anxious or afraid, but rest with renewed faith in the sovereign savior and shepherd of your soul who is at work within you by the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit, the guarantee and promise of eternal life. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Amen. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for your word to us this morning. Lord, thank you that we can desire and indeed become less and less anxious and afraid. Lord, thank you that you have secured a salvation for us that we could not accomplish on our own. Lord, in Christ Jesus, the one who has made a covenant of peace 
And through Him we get the peace that surpasses all understanding. Lord, the peace that is in our hearts and our minds through Him alone, through Christ Jesus, our Savior. Lord, it's in His glorious, gracious, and anxious, casting away, fear subsiding name that we pray this morning. Amen. Amen.